Welcome back for session three. Uh, we are at that almost halfway point. <laughs> Hopefully you are all still doing well and um, finding this to be very useful. We are going to start talking about attachment traumas and relational repair. The objectives for this session are to develop an understanding of attachment, especially related to attachment theory, we'll get into that, and how disrupted attachment may manifest in students. We're also going to explain the concept of ad hoc attachment relationships and identify various methods to accommodate uh, and or it's kind of both help repair disrupted attachments in students with relationships. Because as we said at the beginning, y'all are change makers. Um, this is an opportunity in your relationship to cause some really healthy healing type relationships. So before we get started, um, if you're following along in Pear Deck, and if you're not, please do open the slides uh, after you watch this presentation and go ahead and pop in your answer. What are you wondering about uh, regarding the topic of attachment? We're really curious to see. And again, Kevin and I will be following up. You can pause here if you'd like to do that now. So what is attachment? So I like to think of attachment as a tennis match. So there's this serve and return constantly happening. And the other way to think about it is this figure eight. So this starts off as soon as we are born. And it is to whomever is the closest caregiver. Um, so baby cries, caregiver notices and responds to that cry. Baby cries, caregiver notices and responds to that cry and back and forth. So attachment occurs through that constant serve and return. And um, I love this. It is a deep and enduring emotional bond that connects one person to another across time and space. Across time and space is so important for us to think about when we think about our students and their attachment figures. Um, I lost my father this past year and I still feel attached to him. We still have that deep and enduring emotional bond, even though he might not actually be sharing like physical space with me. So attachment doesn't end just because a person's gone. Uh, so just be thoughtful about that. A lot of our students and scholars will share with you that their primary attachment partners are not in their lives because of a multitude of reasons. And that doesn't mean that they're any less important to them than um, if they were actually physically here. Attachment may or may not be reciprocal. This is when we start thinking about people who have maybe some um, disordered type understanding of serve and return responses. So people whose affects may be a little bit off or shut down. Uh, what this is getting at is that children are almost always not depending upon personal or personal, depending upon certain disabilities, but almost always seeking out the soothing of their caregiver, regardless of that caregiver is able to provide that in kind. And it's both, uh, the person who's giving them that care doesn't necessarily have to be invested in them in order to meet some of those needs. That sounds really bleak, but attachment goes back to our most basic survival and not thinking about thriving in the original theory. And we'll talk about some of the nuances there, but just the, the basic concept, it doesn't have to be reciprocal. Gary Braffenbrenner, who is one of my favorite theorists, would say that uh, in order for a child to really thrive, they need to have one person in their life that is just crazy about them. And that's the difference between like surviving and thriving, right? So I am inviting you all to be the people that are crazy about kids so that they can thrive if they don't already have people. And if they do, cool. Like let's, let's pack kids lives full of people who just are, think they're amazing. Right. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I can never have enough cheerleaders. <laughs> um, most people really thrive on positive reinforcement, even our students where it might be ego dystonic to start. And Kevin will get more into some of the formulation around that in our next session. So we've talked about this a little bit, but it's we're looking at specific behaviors in children 
uh, when we're thinking about attachment and they're typically characterized by seeking proximity to whomever that caregiver is when they're upset or feeling threatened. This research was actually developed in the 1950s from a researcher named Mary Ainsworth. And what Mary Ainsworth did was she looked at how children responded when their caregiver left the room in response to strangers then entering the space. So she was looking to see if children were seeking out their caregiver, if they were really ambivalent or not impacted by their caregiver leaving, uh, if they were really maybe distraught to the point where they couldn't regulate, if they were totally fine. So we'll get more into the four strategies that her research really boiled down to. And I, um, I apologize, I misspoke. I said the 1950s, I actually meant to say the 1970s. So, um, and again, this research was meant to observe attachment security in children within the context of their caregiving relationship with whomever that caregiver was. Her research was normed at a time where caregiver was typically thought to be a bio mom. And we know families don't look like that in most contexts. Uh, and we want to have invitation to all of our family and caregivers, not just at District 916, but hopefully across spaces that uh, your family is whomever you identify to be your family. So uh, just be thoughtful about some of that as we're talking about the research and some of the paradigms that were very apparent in our culture in the 70s versus now. Uh, the cool part about attachment, there's actually lots. I, I really like attachment theory. I should disclose that. Uh, I think it's phenomenal and is a really good grounding for all work with kids. Uh, but it's really cool because it appears universally across all cultures. It, you could go to a, a different country right now and um, observe a caregiver with a child and you would see that serve and return response. Now, I, I don't actually recommend you doing that because we have a global pandemic, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> I told y'all I thought I'm funny. Um, but <laughs> in typical circumstances, or if you want to access the internet, um, they have some cool cameras and things of like life happening in the world, I'm told. Uh, you might be able to observe that there. So the strongest connection tends to be for a baby. So this is, again, right after you're out in the world. Um, it tends to be with the person who most accurately interprets the baby's signals. Uh, and there are people, you might be one of them, who depending upon the cry the baby is making, they know what that cry means. Babies don't need that, though, in order to have firm connection. Uh, it's just a matter of um, really interesting and, you know, as we're going over the research. And again, attachment is really uh, developed within that communication, play, tactile comfort. Uh, it's about time. So can you give them your time? That's how this develops. Okay, so appears driven by a child's expectation to the parent's response. Yep, so what this is looking at is as, so your very first moments as a baby, you start those serve and return responses. And then as you continue to grow and develop, based on how that caregiver returned your responses, that's what you expect of every other adult in your world. So if your caregivers were super responsive and engaged and comforting and caregiving, Cool, like you got your needs met and you trust adults to do that. If for a variety of reasons they were unable to do that, your caregiver, then you don't trust that the other adults in your environment will be able to provide for your needs. We've already talked a little bit about this. And this, again, the language in here was written by Pete Singer. He uses the term parenting. Uh, you know, I struggle with that because I think it, again, talks about kind of what those cultural paradigms are and, like, what family should be and who parents are. So I, I want to broaden the definition uh, and invite that uh, warm, sensitive, and caring 
providers, caregivers, family systems, uh, supports. It, I mean, it looks really different for all of our kids. Uh, and just because it might not be that nuclear family doesn't mean that they're not getting their needs met. Um, so yeah, but it contributes to their healthy attachment and their development of being able to um, have those relationships. And we'll break down those attachment um, models here in a few minutes. Ideally, though, children develop a sense of secure attachment, and that develops when caregiver interactions are really specific to a child's temperament and their attachment needs. And again, it's about getting to know that person. Uh, what I need when I am upset might look very different. Well, it does look really different than my partner, uh, like radically. <laughs> so if my uh, caregivers gave me the same sort of comfort his caregivers did, like that wouldn't work to soothe me. Uh, even now as an adult. So it's really important that we really know the children uh, we live with, obviously, and also that we're working with because you need to be detectives and investigate what is that style that they need. Because again, the attachment is about um, their interpretation of how well you are meeting their needs. So secure attachment mitigates many social and emotional risks. So secure attachment is one of those four attachment styles we're going to get into. But persons who develop a secure attachment, uh, which again happens really like birth to three, birth to five, different research says different things. Um, but by the time you're five, you have had some experiences in the world that make you more prevalent to interacting with adults in a certain way in order to get your needs met. And if you have had really caring, attentive caregivers, uh, then you develop into a child who knows that they can have healthy relationships with others that are reciprocal in nature. Uh, you feel comfortable trying new things because failure is not scary. You have people to support you. And as you grow, uh, you are less likely to be vulnerable to people uh, taking advantage of your insecurities or your uh, desires maybe to overly attach to them because you're needing that connection. Uh, oh, another animal study. I think Kevin like planned this, so I got all the animal studies. So this is what they call the wire monkey mama study, um, or I called in grad school, the, I think it's just wire monkey. Um, what they did, though, was they took baby monkeys and they put them, a set of them was with a caregiver that was an adult monkey, and the other baby monkeys were with a caregiver that was a wire fur covered contraption. Um, and through that, scientists provided in the fur contraption method um, for the monkeys' most basic needs. So they had food, they had shelter, but that was it because a wire puppet can't provide you reciprocal interaction or serve in return responses, it just exists. Other monkey caregiver was um, alive. <laughs> so immediately in my mind, it has like an up. And, uh, you know, provided not just the most basics for survival, but again, like those serve and return responses, um, the type of caregiving conditions that support a baby monkey's ability to thrive is kind of what they were able to provide in that scenario. What they found, which is heartbreaking, and please do not look up the study or the videos unless like you're really curious and then obviously do what you feel is best, but the videos around it break my heart because you will see these baby monkeys who have a non-responsive caregiver because it is a wire puppet and they are like seeking that tactile comfort, that touch. Um, by rubbing into that fur just in order to get their soothing needs met. And I feel like it's heartbreaking. Like, I don't know why we did that. Um, but what it tells us is that we, as children, 
from birth, we work with the caregivers we have, uh, even if they can't meet all of our needs. And as we grow up, uh, what they found was that um, the monkeys that were raised by the wire monkey um, were more timid. They didn't know how to act with other monkeys because they never had that modeled for them, right? Like those early attachment relationships teach us how to act with other people. Um, they were easily bullied. They wouldn't stand up for themselves. They had difficulty mating. And when um, they did reproduce, they were found to be, it was female monkeys, so inadequate mothers, um, in, in that they themselves did not know how to provide for the care of the children they birthed. So yeah, it's it's a rough study. Uh, I think, again, from the pieces we're able to take away, it's that a child will seek tactile comfort from anything, even if it's not a responsive caregiver. Uh, and the more responsive we are as caregivers, not just to basic needs, the better we set our children up for um, really positive outcomes later. They have a better sense of self and uh, they trust other people. That's what we want. Uh, they also learn those very early social skills from birth in those reciprocal interactions. So as we get into the research about what Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby, her team in the 70s, determined, uh, again, there's those four areas of attachment, but I really like to think of them more as um, a quadrant because different interactions in your life and experiences and relationships move you um, along different places on this quadrant. Mm, sorry, I'm drawing. I wasn't prepared for this. I'm used to being in the classroom with papers. Uh, oh, anxious. Okay, so these words mean nothing to you yet. We will get there. But we have secure attachment, which is really where we want folks to be. Uh, we have avoidant attachment and anxious attachment, which um, nothing makes sense there. We'll get into that. And then we have more of a fearful attachment style. So let's say... Uh, I am raised in a really um, supportive home with uh, positive caregivers. Maybe I have multiple caregivers available to me. Uh, I develop a really great sense of self. School starts, I'm doing well. So maybe I am like super secure. And maybe when I start school, like the teacher doesn't like me. And I don't actually know how to make friends super well because maybe I'm kind of quirky or uh, maybe I have a disability that gets in the way, like of my social understanding. And the way I respond to that is maybe to over try to people please, or maybe it's to shut down and withdraw and become kind of um, distant. So maybe I move down and I'm moving more over here if I'm moving more distant, right? Um, but, oh, gosh, you know what? Some time goes on, and I actually start to, like, here I'm distant. Maybe I start to really change that style up, and I notice, oh, gosh, people really like me if I meet all of their needs, but I don't think about my own anymore. So I'm no longer secure. Maybe I'm kind of moving over here. So, again, throughout your life cycle, depending upon the different experiences you have, you will move all over these quadrants. That's really typical. Ideally, though, people stay in this like mostly secure, somewhat kind of anxious, maybe somewhat kind of avoidant piece, and we're not falling down to this more fearful attachment. That plays into the next point. It's about probability, not destiny, which is why our work is so vitally important uh, to supporting positive outcomes for kids. So we've talked about this already, um, but briefly, attachment grows through proximity. Closeness, uh, sameness uh, can really be helpful. Obviously, when you uh, are born to a family of origin and you are able to remain in that family of origin or any family really that provided you with some sort of sameness is super supportive for that development of attachment. Uh, belonging is really key. And from there, you develop senses of loyalty and personal significance. You have love. Um, attachment and love are really hand in hand. The people you attach to in the, the biggest sense, not our ad hoc attachments, not our school attachments per se, but our family attachments, like we're connected by love and by being known. 
so attachment can be inhibited by what I like to call um, the first category, that inconsistent availability, um, producing hyperactive strategies, is the slot machine effect, right? So, and like, I am not a gambler, but this just is kind of how I think about it. So if I am at a slot machine and I am constantly popping in coins and occasionally and I, I don't know when or at what interval, there's no predictability or consistency to it, I get this big windfall. I'm likely going to stay at that slot machine, even though it's not consistent, and keep putting my time and attention and energy, hoping and praying that maybe at some point I will get that big windfall. It is the same for children who have caregivers that are inconsistent in their availability. They try so, 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 so hard to get their attention because sometimes, and who knows when or who knows what, but something will trigger that big windfall of love and attention and sameness and belonging and significance. There's also that consistent unavailability. Right? And this is um, kind of going along with that slot machine uh, imagery. If you are at a slot machine for, let's say, like an hour, uh, I don't know how long these things usually last, but if I'm putting money into something for an hour and it doesn't pay me out at any point, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to be done. So when we have caregivers that are consistently unavailable, we're going to shut down. We're not going to try anymore because what's the point? Yeah. Um, and, and again, we've already started talking about this a little bit, but there are persons who, due to their neurobiolo uh, uh, neurobiological concerns and genetic makeup, have sometimes difficulties understanding relationships. And we think about that, especially with our students uh, with autism spectrum disorder, reading facial expressions and connecting it just looks different it, it doesn't mean that it's not possible it just means that attachment can be impaired because of those things so we just need to be thoughtful about it attachment may also be hurt by things outside of the parent's control uh, I, and again caregivers right so a lot of times they're has been in the past, um, this kind of preconceived us versus them in schools, right? Them being the parents, us being the, the school staff trying so hard and we have to send them, the children back to that awful environment. I, I, I've heard this narrative a lot. Um, if that's the narrative in your head, I, I really encourage you to do some very conscious deconstructing of uh, your paradigms and values related to education. And there are families and children who have awful circumstances that they are navigating. And because of that, sometimes caregivers aren't able to provide children with the sort of environment uh, or emotional attunement that's needed um, for attachment to happen. Even though the child themselves might be attached to that parent, that reciprocal part of the relationship might be impacted or impaired. So, soapbox a little. Sorry, not sorry. Moving on. Okay, so circle of security. This is just to kind of help you visualize what that serve and return response looks like as kids get a little bit bigger, right? So we know baby cries. Caregiver responds, baby coos, caregiver responds. As they get a little bit bigger, they're highly mobile. Y'all, my nephew is almost two and like constantly trying to kill himself. Um, so this is very real in my family right now. But it, basically, um, you as caregiver are a secure base. While the child goes out and has some exploration in their world. And as they explore the world around them, what they're looking for from you as caregiver, uh, be it as a primary attachment figure, because that is a child that is in some way tangibly yours, uh, or as an ad hoc attachment figure, because they are maybe your student, they are wanting you to watch over them, 
delight in them, help them, and enjoy them. They don't need you to do things for them, but to come alongside them. And when things get really hard, ideally they come to you and you just welcome that return and you provide them that emotional regulation again by offering them comfort, delighting in them, supporting them by being their executive functioning. So when people are, um, and Kevin will get into this in the next section a little bit more, but when you are unable because you are having all of these big feelings and emotional responses um, to emotionally regulate, you can oftentimes use another adult in the space or an adult if you're a child in the space uh, to support your emotional regulation. It's called co-regulation. And that's what that organize my feelings is about. Um, children need your help in teasing out those big feelings because it's too much. It overwhelms their system. And when they're regulated again, they go off and learn and explore again. Right? Um, the idea here is that as adults, um, we're asking you to always be wiser and kinder. This is bigger and stronger. I mean, I, I guess in those ways you can think of like emotional strength and size. Like we need you to have larger emotional capacity and strength than kids. Um, whenever possible, we are inviting you to follow your students' needs, right? And whenever necessary, kids need us to take charge, but in a predictable, consistent manner. And again, Kevin will get more into that. That's what develops this circle of security. Oh, this is a repeat. Sorry. Okay. So if you are in Pear Deck, and again, I hope you are, <laughs> and you were super curious once I go through this, uh, there is a link in here that does not provide us with the results, but it is a link that you can do your own free attachment style test. So if you're curious and you want to know, uh, you can hit the link in your student view and it will bring you to a separate screen. The district won't know like, oh, that new Lindsay, she is a disorganized attachment style. We got to watch out for her. No, it's nothing like that. Um, but I do know people are curious. Uh, when I've taught this in the past, this has been a, an area of interest for folks. So this research presented on this slide is somewhat dated. Uh, this is from 2011. And what it shows us is those four primary attachment styles that Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby identified based on their research in the 1970s not 50s. Um, these sometimes have different names too. So this might be a concept you've heard of and you've heard it called something else. That's okay. They're fairly interchangeable in the way that research talks about them. I was trained in my social work training um, to talk about the four attachment styles with these labels. So that's my comfort. That's not all of it's about you guys. <laughs> <sighs> It's really hard not being able to see your responses. Anywho, um, so great news. Most of the country, so you know, 2011, 65% of the population is identified as having secure attachment. That means that as children, uh, they are able to explore the world. They're pretty predictably happy. Their caregivers um, have been sensitive to their needs and consistent and the child themselves comes to school feeling that they can trust the adults uh, they can trust other kids they can try hard things and even if they're not successful that's going to be okay about 20 percent of the population uh, at this time reported to an avoidant attachment style and what that means is that a child is emotionally distant. They're not super big on exploring. They tend to keep to themselves. Their caregivers are also typically fairly distant and disengaged. And in there, the child does believe, even on, this is subconsciously, but it can be on a conscious level, uh, that their needs won't be met. So in order to protect themselves and self-preservation, why bother trying to get anyone to meet their needs? Ambivalent is about 10 to 15% of the population. Uh, I think when I made my little grid, 
I usually call it anxious. So it's avoidant, anxious avoidant, or anxious ambivalent. Anyway, um, these persons tend to be highly insecure and anxious. And it, they put angry here. Um, my practice experience is less, it, it's not like explosive anger. It's more like that taking apart themselves anger. So it's really internal, but like feeling like they're not good enough and they become easily frustrated when they fail. Um, or when they not even fail, when they try something and it maybe doesn't go exactly as planned. Um, caregivers in this uh, type of attachment style tend to be inconsistent and it really goes the spectrum. So it's like, oh, and it says sometimes sensitive here, but it's really this concept of maybe like overly sensitive to their kids' needs, maybe um, unnecessarily suffocating uh or neglectful where nothing like the needs aren't being met uh and what children identify in this is that again they can't trust adults or other children or really anyone um to meet their needs but in this scenario instead of turning in on themselves they're going to like keep trying so 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 hard to get that need met, right? So it's the slot machine that occasionally has the big payout. When we have children with disorganized attachment, and that's about 10 to 15% of the general population, right? So these numbers in special ed, when we start looking at like avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganized, they probably do make up a larger percentage of the population that of the students we serve. And again, like rest easy that most kids do have a really secure foundation, which is great. Um, but disorganized attachment style children tend to be depressed, angry, um, completely passive to the point of non-responsive. So, and this looks different um, depending upon the child. Um, they tend to get confused about what strategy they need to get their needs met. And oftentimes they're really seeking um, power and control over others in order to get that need met. So it's this totality in the way they engage with others. Um, and that comes from the caregiver themselves being maybe extremely erratic or frightened or frightening. Um, and then again, like they're either the caregiver tends to be extremely passive or extremely intrusive. And it's not like coddling, suffocating, like in a uh, a manageable, haha, my family is Italian, which they are. And, you know, you can't walk throughout the house without getting hugged or told you love you because that's how it is. Um, it's like you don't have your own boundaries in this disorganized attachment model. So that was totally um, the jokes about Italians from my own family experience. Okay. Oh, so if you're here and you are taking this attachment um, test, not really a test, but survey, um, go ahead and hit pause. Go ahead and do that. Look at how cool your results are and hit playback on the presentation when you're ready to return. Okay, this is where I really nerd out. Sorry. Uh, so when we teach kids about trauma, because we do at 916, uh, we sometimes utilize strategies that make it accessible to them. And by sometimes, I mean, we always really, really try. And sometimes we hit the mark and sometimes kids are like, why are you talking to me about this? Especially my kids because they're teenagers. It's what it is. <laughs> so uh, another way to think about these attachment styles, and again, this is a model um, or an example from a lesson that some of the social workers did, was we talked about attachment styles in relationship to frozen characters. And I think it's kind of fun. So we're going to do that as a group, kind of, where you can't respond to me. But if you don't know frozen, I'm sorry. Um, but it's a pandemic and there's Disney Plus, y'all. Like, let's... Let's get on that. You need to sing some Let It Go. Okay. Um, again, sorry. I think I'm funny. So we're going to start off with the um, person who identifies as male. Uh, and he is standing in front of a moose. That is 
Kristoff. And Kristoff, for the purposes of Frozen, uh, acts as our secure attachment figure, right? So Kristoff's family um, is not biologically connected, and they are very loving and kind and supportive to his needs, and he is able to connect with them, but also not, you know, like he is a functioning adult. He doesn't always need them around. Uh, he is slower to develop relationships, but not in a way that impairs his ability. He just waits to get to know people. That's a healthy, normal boundary, right? Like you don't want to just be best friends with everybody. So yeah, for the purposes of this, Kristoff is our secure attachment. That moves us to Elsa, who is in the center here. And, um, that person identifies with female pronouns. And Elza has her sparkly snowflake magic. So Elsa and the other person next to her identifies as female, Anna, uh, they are sisters. And they experience fairly early traumas that impact their attachment. One of them is that Elsa scares her parents with her magic. They are genuinely fearful of her and they try to suppress her ability to do magic, um, which, you know, kind of sounds goofy, but if you go back here, right? So like they're frightened of her, um, but not to the point where they don't engage at all, but to the point where they're distant and disengaged for Elsa. And where because of everything else going on in the world, they're inconsistent with Anna. Because they're worried about their daughter having magical powers. I've never experienced that. But yeah, I think that would be kind of freaky. Um, their parents also die pretty early on in the movie when they're children. And that definitely impacts their ability to repair those attachment relationships. So again, attachment's not fixed. And it does occur across time and space, but the person is not physically here for you to have those reparative experiences with. You can have them with other people and it doesn't repair like if there's no other caregiver there. And in this scenario, there's no other caregiver there. So they stay fixed in those childhood attachment styles. And for Elsa, it ends up being that ice queen, right? Like literally she is an ice queen. Um, and we would put her under the avoidant attachment style. So she's distant, disengaged. For Anna, she is super anxious about her attachments. She wants so badly for someone, anyone, please, 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 please to love her. Um, so she would go more under that uh, ambivalent. She doesn't rely on other people to meet her needs, but man, she's just going to keep trying, uh, which leads her to Hans. So the person on the very end identifies as male, and he, for all intents and purposes in a children's movie, because there always has to be a bad person, a bad guy, as my nephew likes to say. Uh, that's who he characterizes. And really, oh, he just has disorganized attachment. When Hans tells you about his story, uh, he is the youngest in this really large family. Uh, his caregivers, and you know, I'm, I'm adding some things here for the purposes of this example, um, but his caregivers seem to be really erratic. Uh, it's likely he was often um, finding them frightening because he has no connection to them. And they were likely very passive because there were so many other children to care give. So because of that, uh, Hans has developed a style where uh, he seeks connection through control. And that's what we see play out in the movie. Now, that does not actually mean that he is a bad person. It means that he just didn't have any of y'all around to support him in repairing those early attachment relationships. So there is my frozen attachment style lesson. Thank you. Uh, I also don't talk about the moose or the snowman because um, they're not real. Okay, for the purposes of the next few slides, I'm just going to 
briefly review them, but um, feel free to pause if you'd like to read them more in depth. We've already talked about that disorganized, or as I named it, fearful attachment style. Uh, when we think about reactive attachment disorder, as well as disinhibited social engagement disorder, those are really related to diagnoses in a clinical setting where we are looking at treatment. And while some of our related services do offer that, um, for the purposes of this presentation, it's more just if you're interested uh, and it doesn't necessarily impact how you will engage with kids. Okay. So when students have disrupted attachment, it appears like behavioral, right? Because behavior is a style of communication or a way to communicate that we have needs. So when we look at the behavior in kids with disrupted attachment, we often find that they're argumentative, disrespectful, tricky, that's loaded. Uh, respect looks different in different spaces and places, but for the purposes of this, um, disrespectful in a school environment. Um, children are prone to emotional outbursts. They can be violent or aggressive. And just like they have that kind of that spectrum, right? <laughs> they, they tend to be on both ends. So it's either really, really big behaviors or really, really shut down. So we might also see that isolated helplessness. Uh, controlling, manipulative. And I, I really encourage you to think about um, relationship seeking when you are thinking about a child's behavior as manipulative. Likely it it almost always goes back to this. They are trying to seek a relationship and they just don't have the skills yet. Uh, it can feel like um, the subjective experience to the person who's trying to connect with that child that they are focused on negative, um, that they're uncaring or disinterested. It also can look like um, ADHD, so high energy with poor impulse control and high distraction. And oftentimes, uh, we will get kids in our programs who have some sort of clinical diagnosis of ADHD, but really it's more about their anxiety and trauma uh, related to attachment. Uh, they don't actually have ADHD. They just look similar. Okay, so it was a lot that I just threw at you in a short amount of time. Go ahead and pause here if you would like and take a break. It'll give you some student instructions on the side. Uh, and once you are ready, please hit play again. All right. I was just talking about this before we paused, but this is related to some research from Shaw and Pez. And they're saying that in their experience, nearly all children with disordered attachment or reactive attachment disorder have been given the diagnosis of ADHD at some time. And again, the symptoms behaviorally that they look for in ADHD also look very similar to kids who have disrupted attachment uh, in that those kids tend to be highly anxious and all over the place, high energy, etc. So now we're going to move into what can we do? And that comes to this ad hoc attachment relationship. So, uh, especially in situations in which parents are not available, such as in school settings, most times caregivers aren't in our school settings. Uh, the caregivers at home aren't present in our school buildings. We have caregivers, but they're school staff. Um, alternate adult caregivers might temporarily play the role of attachment figures. So again, it's not about stepping in to be a primary caregiver. It's about in the time you have with the child, um, recognizing your ability and supporting their attunement to you. A growing body of research points to the significance of the teacher and educational uh, support staff, uh, child relationships. So this is pretty much a theme that you will see in every single one of these sessions that the responsibility of this work will never fully rest on you. I, we work in teams, we work with families and caregivers and organizations and community. And if you happen to be a person who's very skilled at developing ad hoc attachment relationships with kids, great. Uh, just make sure that you're not the only person that has a relationship with that kid because then they're not generalizing the skills that they're learning with you. It's not a full attachment bond, 
And a lot of times it's not unique or enduring. That's okay. Because again, this work isn't about you. It's about your students. We're doing this to teach them new skills. So if they're able to learn those skills in the context of the relationship with you, generalize them and move to a less restrictive setting, then like high fives all around. We met our goals as a school district and that child is on a better trajectory because they are um, retaining skills that are more in line with like a normative developmental trajectory. So great. Um, it allows you when you are an ad hoc attachment figure um, to be some security that maybe that student can't get elsewhere, especially when students first start in our programs, uh, they don't have a lot of relationships. And if you're one of the first people they're connecting with, again, amazing. You're that sense of security and help them generalize that. Introduce them to other stuff you really like. Introduce them to stuff maybe you don't like, but make it look really positive. They're constantly watching us. So the more we are able to model for them um, healthy reciprocal interactions, um, the more likely kids are to pick up on those skills and start applying them not just to other adults, but really other kids because we want them to make friends with their peers. Uh, you will notice a lot of times uh, for our students, the first relationships they develop typically are with the adults, even with kids who have significant trauma. Um, they don't trust other kids to be safe, almost more so sometimes than the adults. So um, give them opportunities to practice with other people if you end up being that first or favorite or primary ad hoc attachment person. It also when you are that primary ad hoc attachment person or persons, uh, you're more likely to experience kids reenacting behaviors or acting out. Uh, when kids do not feel comfortable with calm environments because they are used to chaos uh, or they are used to caregivers that do not meet their needs or are abusive, uh, they at times will elicit those responses from us or attempt to in these acting out behaviors. Uh, and the more they care about you and are invested in you as a grown up, the harder they sometimes try because you're the safe person. It doesn't make a lot of sense if you haven't outright experienced it. And it just, it happens. <laughs> so be ready for it. And when it does know that again, it's not about you and rely on your teammates to help support you and process through it, it's going to bring up a lot of feelings and that's normal and that's okay. Um, so rely on your teammates and lean into support. Uh, now the research does say that this is mostly effective or more effective with younger children. So our elementary kids and <laughs> um, some research disagrees with that and disputes it. Uh, I would say I've worked with teenagers for eight years at Cora, which was Capital View before, and teachers, or teachers, teachers too, teenagers um, gain emotional comfort and support from their staff. Oftentimes, even in a secure attachment formulation for a child, their teenage years are when they are trying to seek out on their own like what their life is going to be and they're even more reliant on adults to kind of be that Jiminy Cricket on their shoulder or that executive functioning voice um, trying to help them navigate some of those really big decisions that they don't have experience with yet. And then obviously ad hoc attachment uh, decreases the negative impact of disrupted attachment, right? So trauma heals in the context of relationships. Attachment is the most primary function of a relationship. Uh, so if you are able to develop that healthy attachment, you're not just repairing their trauma, but you are um, mitigating and decreasing the impact of just dis disrupted attachment. So we talked about secure base. We talked about safe haven. That was that graphic of children running around. Uh, again, you can pause here and read more in depth. 
The safe haven function may continue to be important for vulnerable children, such as those with family problems or self-regulation or emotional problems. This is important because most of our students, uh, a high percentage, we would consider to be vulnerable, right? So they need us as the ad hoc attachment figure to develop that secure base for them. So as we send them out to do school throughout the day, uh, we're part of that process in that we're watching over them, delighting in them, helping them, uh, enjoying them. And when things get hard, they know they can come to us uh, without fear of any sort of, you know, repercussion and then move back into whatever they were doing, which is why um, a lot of our interventions are focused on how do we help kids get back to class. It's one, because we're school, <laughs> we, we want them to learn. And two, we want them to develop um, a sense of independence as they're developing that attachment. So it's really this parallel process that has to be happening um, because we're not getting students when they're first born, right? We're getting them later. So we're trying to develop some mastery um, and skills that are more developmentally appropriate depending upon their developmental needs and level uh, in relationship to also providing these um, very early skills around like secure base and safe haven. Um, we've talked a lot about this uh, and we will continue to, but basically we need to have high quality relationships with kids and in that kids can develop self-regulation and that in turn develops into um, more improved adaptive social and academic functioning. So how do we do it? Um, we need to first expect uh, some things at the foundation of this relationship, right? So. One, it's going to be hard. You just need to come in expecting that. And that's okay. Um, the second point really goes into that too, that it, it'll be difficult. So it's going to be hard and difficult. Um, testing. Kids are going to test us. They want to see how we're going to respond. Um, some of it will be that enacting once you have a relationship. But prior to that even, you might feel like you're being provoked. And again, it's because the kid wants to see how, are you going to be safe? Are you going to be calm and rational and work through the problem with them in a joining way? Are you going to be uh, honest, honest and genuine and authentic? So sorry, getting tongue tied today. Or are you going to lose it and go off on them? Expect difficulty during times of transitions. So before we have breaks in our district, those are some of the hardest times because kids are trying to navigate a ton of really big feelings and anxiety. And some of them are related to you're not going to be there as their staff. And that's hard. Adjust expectations based on what you observe about the child's attachment, student's attachment. This goes back to um, figure out what that child responds well to in order to try to meet their needs uh, as much as is possible and appropriate with boundaries. And then you yourself, if you have personal attachment disruptions, um, this work might be additionally challenging. And in that, you know, we just invite you to try to get the appropriate level of help and support that you need um, to do this work. So this gets into the how we're doing this. We do this, we develop these ad hoc attachment relationships by providing positive feedback. We strive as a district to catch kids when they're doing the right thing. We have high expectations and we develop relationships. We develop relationships first and foremost by being there. Uh, it is so important to our kids that our staff are present uh, and not just physically, but <laughs> mentally and emotionally during the workday so that we are accessible to them. Uh, we provide effective service plans that are conceptualized and conducted as family service plans. So again, this is that invitation in order to do any of this work well, we have to collaborate with caregivers and communities.
we already have smaller caseloads, so check on that one. Uh, we're going to talk more about uh, formal and informal strategies to support your own stress and secondary traumatic stress during session five. But the foundation of these relationships just has to start with safety and trust, uh, which comes from being consistent and following through. Kids are watching you um, all the time. <laughs> and uh, they're looking to see how you respond to different situations and to different people and how you treat other kids and how you treat your peers. And that's what starts the development of that safety and trust. It's based on just kind of what they see. Oh, when possible and appropriate, um, join them in more informal activities like lunch or just check in on them and say, hey, I, it's important to balance this too. Uh, when we have kids that like to roam the buildings, and we do, if they are roaming the buildings and all of their favorite staff are popping out into the hall to have informal talks, there is no reason for that child to go to class. <laughs> So make sure that if you want to have any kind of informal activity that you're just working with that child's IEP team to ensure that um, we're not accidentally uh, reinforcing any kind of problem-based behavior. We want to have sensitivity to a student's needs. Really, all of our relationships we need to attend to, right? That, like, that sensitivity. Um, when possible, and again, appropriate, just having that weekly one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, as a school, we focus a lot on standards-based instruction. And uh, in order for our students to have their skills ready for learning uh, accessible to them, they have to be regulated. And that regulation oftentimes happens in the context of relationship. So... I'm not encouraging anyone to pull kids out of academics for that one-on-one -on -one time. I am encouraging us to think about a uh, relationship and balance in, um, in relation to. So how can we have both? Uh, ooh, repair ruptures. Oh gosh. I don't know how many times over the years I've had to go back to a kid and be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry because I assume something uh, maybe I thought oh, you know I saw that drawing on the wall and it really looked like what you were doodling in class and I, I just I assumed it was you and that was really wrong of me I'm so sorry uh and you know that sounds maybe ridiculous also because I was like acting and going overboard but the idea here is that we have to model for them like when somebody messes up because we all mess up, right? It, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean that anyone's done with you or we're never going to speak again or we hate you forever. It just means like, oh man, I messed up. I'm really sorry. And I'm going to show you how to apologize and we all move on. And our restorative practices are phenomenal for this uh, because it gives kids, again, like a skill set, uh, which a lot of them come to us without having that because they're used to those ruptures in relationship happening and maybe you just never talk to that person again. So um, repair and when you can model it for a lot of kids, like it, it, being publicly wrong is very powerful in a classroom situation. Um, the more secure attachment, or the more secure your attachment, the better you can handle relationship ruptures, right? So here I think of it like a bank. So if your relationship's a bank and you're constantly making deposits, then that month maybe you're a little bit low on the financial end. Um, it doesn't hurt you so much maybe to not put as much in because like, so this is where I think like um, you're constantly working with a child and you have this really strong foundation, then maybe you're out sick for a week or your attention is pulled elsewhere. You're still connecting, but not as frequently. But luckily you have a lot banked up. They can kind of coast for a little bit, a little bit because they, they need you. Um, or when you have to make a big withdrawal, hopefully you won't go into a negative balance, right? So if you have a really good supportive relationship and you mess up because you will, we all do. Like, I really want to normalize that. We all mess up. We're all only human. Um, but the idea here is that when you've had to make that big withdrawal because you've you know, just had a disruption in the relationship, that there's still enough of a foundation there that you can go back and um, build up again. Um, be really thoughtful in your interactions about your tone, your gestures, and your vocalizations. 
some tones, gestures, and vocalizations work for some kids, some work for others. Uh, just that kind of, you know, get to know kids. Like I, I have students that uh, I am a morning person. And if I start off their morning with, hey, welcome, how are you? It's not going to be, oh, Cara, thank you. I feel so good about being at school. It's going to be, Cara, I'm going to take your coffee and throw it on you. Walk away. Right? So, um, yeah, just know your audience. Try some things. Be thoughtful about it, though. And if you're working with a group of students, it's really important that your tone is fairly consistent. Um, you don't want to be yelling at a child and then, like, really calm with another child in the same group. And that's not to say that you have to, like, constrict your own affect. It's just, kids need you to be fairly consistent. So uh, it's important to do that as often as possible in our tone and gestures and vocalizations. We already talked about the emotionally bigger and stronger and wiser and kinder. Um, goals, right? We want to align our goals to um, emotional connection. We, our social emotional goals on our IEP are all about how do we interact with others. So yeah, check for us there. We're doing that. Uh, strong, positive, and trusting relationships allow students to accept and apply feedback. A lot of our students uh, even, they're not with us for hopefully a large amount of time because they are able to transition back to a less restrictive setting. So you might only get to that point in a relationship where they're accepting your feedback. And for some of them, that's huge. And then hopefully as they are in like a setting three or setting two, they're able then to apply that feedback into their practice. And there are times where kids um, definitely in their time with us learn to accept and apply feedback. It just, it happens over a lot of time. So um, this bullet point, I just don't want you to put yourself in a situation where you're like, well, they're listening to me, but they're not doing it. Like, well, I mean, it's also like really typical for most developmental stages in childhood that you don't listen to adults, especially if you're an adolescent. Like their job is to mostly hear what we say and then do the exact opposite and then have us available to them to process it hopefully after. Um, hyperactivating app. This is clients, but children are often comfortable with low demands at the start of a relationship. So, um, this is, again, Pete formulated this based on his work. Um, but this is thinking about just move at the child's pace, right? Like you don't want to overwhelm them or underwhelm them. Um, just figure out what's comfortable with them and meet them where they're at for them with them. Uh, be fully in it, present and intentional. We talked about that. Our kids need us there, uh, mind, body, and spirit every day <laughs> as much as is possible. Again, we're all human too. It's a balance and allow bad things to happen and help the student. Ah, so there will be times where you will see students setting themselves up, right? Like you can see it like 10 miles away. You're like, oh my God, why are you doing that? Don't do that. It's really important as long as the thing they're setting themselves up for isn't physically harmful, right? that they do that. It's part of learning and growing and developing. And um, when they do that thing, then they can come back to you and you can help them make sense of it. And then hopefully they can accept what you're telling them and apply that feedback, right? That's how it all works. Um, it, our students don't learn or grow, though, if we do for them. And it is not practical to assume we can protect them from everything. Uh, they will move on from our spaces and places to other spaces and places. And they might not have you there. And we're not here to save anybody, right? We're here to teach kids new skills so that they are able to take care of themselves and actively engage as contributing members in our society. Okay, other things you can do, you can just simply be there, uh, like physically, like in their space and, and not like close to them necessarily, but just around them. Um, be present while they're busy. If kids are engaged in an activity, 
like that's cool if like you're walking in to check in on them you don't have to interrupt them right away or if you're one of their favorite staff and they want to catch up with you but also they're working on stuff like just sit next to them so they know you're available but they can still then focus on what they're doing uh, again that sameness we talked about very early on in this presentation the sameness, though, that we find in the community with friends or with family does look different at school, right? We want to have boundaries around what we share. Uh, we don't want to over-disclose to kids. So just think about, you know, what are your shared interests? Like, things that are not superficial, per se, but also, like, not your deepest, darkest secrets. Like, you don't need to put that on them. <laughs> so just... Be thoughtful and intentional in what you share and ensure it is in the service of the relationship. That sameness. So as long as you're sharing your interests, experience, um, strengths and weaknesses in the service of the relationship, great. Um, appearance, you know, we talk um, a lot about how representation matters and it's so vitally important for our students to see themselves reflected in the adults in their lives uh, in that appearance way. So yeah, if that's possible, build on that. Uh, belonging and loyalty. And that comes from just supporting kids, um, repairing the relationship, building on that sameness. Uh, show them that they are significant to you. And that's showing up for the practical ways that matter. Uh, adjusting to them and communicate a worldview that says they matter. Our kids come to us hearing that they are failures. Um, that's why they're in our district um, for our sped kids. They need to hear that people believe in them and that they do have a future and that they matter to you. And in an authentic way, I mean, if you just meet somebody, you can't be like, you're my favorite person ever, right? Well, that would just be not healthy. Um, but over time, you know, as you get to know kids, like saying things to them, like, hey, I'm so happy you're here today. Or, wow, I really missed you this weekend. You know, did you have a good weekend? Or simply saying to them, you know, you really mattered to me or your school staff. Like those are all perfectly phenomenal phrases to use um, to help kids understand that they are significant. We need to care about kids. <laughs> we need to show that we uh, know them, so they're being known. And that comes with a practice um, in therapy we call unconditional positive regard. But it's basically every day is a new day. And for our kids, every hour, sometimes every few minutes, has to be a new few minutes. And we're not going to just shut them down and be done with them because the things that we're experiencing are challenging for us. We're going to acknowledge that the reasons they are engaging in that behavior is because things are really challenging for them. And so we're going to do everything we can to keep ourselves regulated so that we can be open and available to them. Um, being known to just birthday wishes can be a really big thing. Um, check, you know, with your site equity teams to figure out how we've determined ways to do this. It can be tricky with the being known that we also don't want to have favorite kids because those kids will get their needs met better than maybe the kids we don't like as much. So we want to ensure that every kid has access to these strategies and that we are ensuring that all kids in our sites have relationship with adults. Little things that show you know them. Okay, I have a great example about Kevin, who's not here, which is great. So, <laughs> Kevin's really, really, really good at this. Uh, when he works with kids, he like typically has some kind of snack. It's typically a snack that they really like, um, and he has like a variety of them. Um, now, again, like in relationship to like your school systems. So like you don't want to um, do anything that's going to impair the MTSS process or PVIS or TCIT. And he's checked this out with all these people. So snack might not always be the right thing at your site. Check in to see if it is. But for him and this, the purpose of this, it is. And what he will do is when it is his time to meet with a child, he will pull them from their class and he will just have that snack immediately in his hand right outside the door. And it 
is inevitably a snack that they really wanted. And you just see their face light up. And it's so fun to watch. And he does this for his peers. Um, so a lot of um, the social workers on my team, we like to wear very bold lipstick choices and Kevin knows like we have lots of conversations about this so um he will make like side jokes to us about it or um he will offhandedly be like oh is that a new color it's like he just notices things and those like little noticing things like show us as his peers and the snacks and things with the kids that he knows them he knows what they're into he's taking the time so um if he's watching this right now I'm sure he is mortified because he hates when people say nice things about him uh and it's important so okay hold emotions when kids come with anything to school because they bring all the things they need to know that you can just be there as a container for all those big emotions so that they can um, lean into you and process them if they need, but they might not even need that. They just might need a container. So be that container that shows them that you see them, you know them, you're showing up for them. Students respond to authenticity. Surprise. Students respond in classrooms that feel emotionally safe. You already knew that, I bet. And they respond to being noticed, heard, understood. <laughs> they grow when the adult in the classroom believes in their potential and makes space for it. This is where it is vitally important for us, again, to evaluate what types of biases we bring into the education system that may potentially impair kids' potential. We have to ensure that they are given high expectations and not high based on what Kara thinks they can do, but high expectations, period. So uh, ensure that that's happening in your own work and um, development so that kids believe in their potential and that they have space to meet it wherever it is. Okay, so that is the end of this session. Uh, I apologize if you didn't find me as funny as I find myself. I promise in person, I am funnier, question mark. Uh, this is the end of my time with you all, though. I want to thank you all so, so very much for going through this uh, and just apologize again that this wasn't through our preferred method, which would be in person. Uh, I am really looking forward to meeting all of you, and I just invite you one last time to go ahead and pause here and using your Pear Deck slides, please go ahead and pop in some feedback for us um, around what something interesting you learned. And this is today, but I'm only interested in this session. So what's something uh, about relational repair and attachment that you found interesting? And um, can you relate this to something in your own life? So thank you again. 